Um, so this is Stephanie Malin. She is a sociologist here at uh, Colorado State University. And she studies environment, globalization, and development, focused, uh, focusing on community-level outcomes of natural resource development. Her main interests include environmental justice, environmental health, social mobilization, poverty, and political economy of energy development. She examines these variables, how they intersect in rural communities across the American West and Northeast. So I will hand it over to Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. And thank all of you for being here on a Friday afternoon. I'm pretty impressed. Ooh, and I see a lot of familiar faces now that I'm standing up here. Hello, everyone. OK, so well, ooh, I've got to get my presentation up here. And then we will be all set. OK, so today I'm going to, um, as Ashley said, right? I'm a sociologist. I study environmental justice and environmental health. Um, I work with a bunch of different, I'm, I'm in the Department of Sociology, but I also am an adjunct, prof so I'm with, with the School of Public Health as well, the Col Colorado School of Public Health, because a lot of what I look at is how we think of disease and illness and this paradigm shift that we're going through right now um, related to moving from the biomedical model of everything being individual-centered in terms of our health and our disease models to actually paying attention to the fact that we are organisms in an environment covered in a permeable organ and we can actually be affected by toxins in our environment, right? So a lot of what I look at in terms of environmental justice has to do with that, contested illness, um, and um, I've done a postdoc on that at, at Brown and things like that. I'm also with um, the Water Center at CSU, the School for Global Environmental Sustainability. I'm going to move this a little because I tend to walk around or move and I don't want to trip because that would just be too entertaining. Um, and I've worked with, for the Center for Disaster and Risk Analysis as well. So I'm coming at this from many different perspectives. And I wanted to make sure that I gave us a, a little definition or a range of definitions for environmental justice because um, there are so many out there. And it's important for us to understand kind of where different groups of interest groups and different groups of people are coming from. So activists tend to define environmental justice as impacts to places where we live, where we work, where we play, where we pray, and, and where we learn. I would add to that as well, right? So what this means is in environmental justice, we're not just concerned about the quality of the natural environment or what we think of as the natural environment, right? But it also very much includes the built environment. And when this became not just a set of research proposals, but more importantly, a set of grassroots activism that began especially in the 70s and 80s in the United States, that was kind of revolutionary, right? So we would think of the environment as part of what we build as, as human beings, right? So this includes things like cities, infrastructure, apartments, homes, this building that we're in right now. We spend, people spend about 90% of our time indoors in the United States, and so the built environment really impacts our health and our well-being. It's important for us to understand, too, in terms of environmental justice, there are radically different definitions. And when you look at the EPA definition of environmental justice, for example, they have to enforce that in a legal setting, right? So it's very different from the more radical definitions of environmental justice that you might get if you, if you um, looked at ejnet.org or something, right? This is kind of the radical um, activist representation of environmental justice. So I want us to understand there's a variation here. But really what I will focus on today is what happens when the requirements of our built environment, so the energy and the natural resources that we require, are impacting the integrity of the, the natural environment, right? And, and in Colorado, we're really kind of seeing this, we're, we're at the epicenter of this because we are such an energy production hotspot. Um, and today, I will, I'll talk a little bit about uranium development for nuclear power, but also unconventional oil and gas extraction that we are in the middle of here in, in kind of this booming area of oil extraction to our east and natural gas extraction to our west, right? Um, the big thing to understand, too, is that this isn't new, right? Colorado, even our system of water rights, has been set up to accommodate mining. 
and the milling that went along with it. We have been kind of a resource extraction outpost for, for a very long time. That's a big part of our history. Now that we have new development in oil and gas, right, we're, we're kind of, we, we've had oil booms before, but the scale of oil and gas development in Colorado is rather unprecedented. So for example, in Weld County, there are right now around 21,000 wells operating, the most wells in any county in the nation. And a lot of us don't know that, right? It, it's amazing how invisible these things become in the landscape. So I have a question for you guys. And I get to talk a little longer than I thought, so I'll be able to talk about both of these. But would you like to hear more about uranium mining and milling for nuclear power? Or would you like to hear more about oil and gas? Who wants to hear about uranium? It's funny, nobody ever wants to hear about uranium. And it always makes me want to be like totally undemocratic and be like, we're going to learn about uranium. So everyone wants to hear about oil and gas. OK, we'll start with that. And then I'll come back to my baby, which is uranium, which sounds really weird. <laughs> the, uh, look at all the good stuff we're missing out on here. OK, so. Um, how many of you are familiar with the basic process of unconventional extraction, which is the combination of vertical and horizontal drilling? So people are pretty comfortable with that. I'll just basically remind us what it is using that graphic over here. But at first, this is from the Energy Information Administration. If you ever want to find out anything about energy extraction or rates of use, they are spectacular to um, really good data to look at. And this map here shows us what are called sail plates. So all that means that R, this is kind of the kind of rock layer that we have learned how now to drill through, right, and essentially create tiny explosions all the way along that drill, that borehole, right, so that we can try to extract little pockets, little bubbles of oil and natural gas. And this map shows us the many places where we actually have these shale plays across the United States. And some of these are developed, some are not. It doesn't, you don't really need to understand all the different colors and everything. But all that we can get from this is that here in Colorado, we're kind of covered, right? And if you then were to map on coal reserves and uranium and many other of the extracted resources that we take from our state, we're pretty inundated with activity. And development is going on in every area that is either yellowish, orange, whatever that looks like to you, or pink, right? It has the chance to expand. Now, you guys know this, right? You're familiar with this. But um, what's different, what's unconventional about this kind of extraction of oil and gas is not just the technological um, combination of directional, so directional and vertical drilling, right? Typically, that, that wasn't a typical thing until about the past 10 years. Uh, but also the social aspect of it. In 2005, we passed the Energy Policy Act, which deregulated oil and gas even more than it already was. And it's one of the most deregulated industries in the, U in the US. Talk to people in oil and gas, they would say the opposite. But if you look at the empirical evidence, it's one of the most deregulated industries has been all along. But the 2005 Energy Policy Act exempted it from 7 out of 15 environmental regulations at the federal level, including the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. Now, what that did, right, that made this process able to locate next to schools, hospitals, residential areas, because reporting related to water quality and safe drinking water and things like that were not required by operators in the industry. So as a sociologist, I call it unconventional, not just in terms of the technology we're using, but the ways in which our policies become technology. Right? And, and the deregulation of, of those systems has really allowed this industry to interact with our our residential and population centers much more than it ever has before, right? and at a very rapid pace. So it's unconventional in a socio-environmental way. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anyone want more explanation for what is actually going on when we talk about hydraulic fracturing? Or is everyone pretty comfortable with that? Air pollution, you mean? So yeah, air pollution is impor very important in that it's it's becoming much more of a regional environmental justice issue. So for example, here in Fort Collins, even though we tried to pass a moratorium, 
have since been taken to court and have been defeated, right, uh, by our Supreme Court at the state level. One of the major concerns driving that in Fort Collins is even though we don't have active drilling in the city limits, right, if you look at our geology, it, it's not really, I mean, we have some of these shale layers of interest, but it's not as likely to develop. The big issue regionally is air pollution, right? And many of you may have noticed, especially the past couple summers, our air quality is really poor. And in fact, Fort Collins is one of the top 25 worst ozone communities or ozone cities as a result of not just oil and gas development, but also the uptick in traffic and as we get as our population grows, right? So you kind of have the, this dovetailing problem, but air pollution especially the release of methane and fugitive emissions is a key problem in terms of, and we're, we're learning more and more about just the extent of that problem related to hydraulic fracturing and the use of pipelines to transport natural gas and oil and other aspects of the production cycle, right? So it's not just the four to six weeks of hydraulic fracturing, it's the entire kind of unconventional production cycle. Does that make sense? And I can talk more about that if you guys have questions about it. So. Um, what I really want us to understand, too, that map hopefully got, this, got that across a little bit, just how many places this can be done in the United States. These pictures are taken while I was in the field doing research. This is in Colorado. And if you can't, you can't really tell what's going on there, those are different components of there are tank batteries, there are compressor stations, there are all sorts of infrastructure that we can see, not just the well pad itself, right? Um, and we can even, if we, if we go out into Weld County or go out into Arapahoe County or some of these places where development is taking place at a really rapid rate, we can see these things kind of going up all over. And it's not just the well pad that we're interested in. But what we get from this picture, hopefully, there's a little farmhouse right there, and this picture, which I took in Pennsylvania when I was doing field work there as well. Um, what's happening is that farmland and oil and gas extraction are coexisting more and more, right? Because to access the land that oil and gas companies need, often they have to enter into partnerships with farmers. Now, the nature of those will vary because, for example, a lot of people who own the surface here in Colorado, it keeps going in and out. I don't know. I'm sorry. We see rural industrialization happening, right, where you have really industrialized processes going on here. But what I was getting at is that some people in Colorado own their mineral rights, right? So they own the wealth under the ground. Lots of people in Pennsylvania own their mineral rights. But in Colorado, that's rarer and rarer, right? You, and often it's a railroad company or an oil and gas company that will own those rights. What this means is, we don't need to know all those details today, but at a certain point, the oil and gas industry has to enter into agreements often with private landowners who, who are often ranchers or farmers. So we see industrialization on their landscape, and we see this impacting more and more communities across the US. So this practice is utilized now in over 20 states. That, that data was from 2012. And there have been over 150,000 wells added in the last decade. There are a variety of communities that are now the sites of extraction, when often the sites of extraction have been invisible rural spaces before. Right? So now we see this happening in much more populated peri-urban and urban areas, to kind of give you a sense of the context. Here is a map to also kind of give you a sense of the context in terms of um, the number, the sheer number of wells, to the point where we can't even see, we can't even really differentiate between the wells that are going in in Wells County. So that's what's in the light blue and the dark blue. And this map here is showing us, the dark blue is, is kind of mapping the oil and gas wells. The dark blue is showing us where they're extracting water. And that's another element of this that I will just touch upon today. But in a water-scarce state, and like Colorado, in a water-scarce region like the West, hydraulic fracturing it has a lot of impact on water markets and water rights and other things that are very important in the context of Colorado in terms of environmental justice. So in terms of social outcomes, as this is rapidly expanding, you guys probably know a lot of this from the news, right? We're seeing divided communities and contested governance. And what I mean by that is we see a, a division in terms of how people view the costs and benefits of this industry. And especially we see land use conflicts, right? We're living in the middle of one right now, where many of us in Fort Collins voted to have a moratorium 
within um, the city limits, right, on drilling, and we have been told by our state Supreme Court that we are not allowed to do that, right, that we cannot have that kind of local control in a state that's a home rule state, right, and, and where a lot of our municipalities are home rule municipalities, meaning that we have at one point or the other voted to be able to have that local right to zone and to control land use. So we are seeing enormous land use conflicts as we have exponential growth in population and the development pressures of that, as well as now there will be even more exponential growth in oil and gas development, right? And the pressures of allowing in both of those land uses on top of the food production that we use. I mean, if we think about Weld County, they're a top 10 ag producer in the United States, right? I think they're number six, as well as being the top county in terms of number of oil and gas wells. So when we think about land use conflicts, right, and the potential when we look at the spill data that's even reported, right, um, and we think about spills on the surface coinciding with agricultural or food, or food production, um, we can kind of think about some of the potential conflicts there, right? And this leads to contested governance, fighting over who decides how we zone land, who gets to zone land, and then who gets to access that land, right? And our state has said that Colorado as a state should regulate this, that they're concerned that mineral rights holders, will their rights will be violated if they're not allowed to sell and develop their rights. Meanwhile, the people living on the surface, you and me and your neighbors, who don't own those mineral rights, are essentially told that's not as important as people being able to make money off of the mineral wealth that they own or company. So that's our, our social context. Now, I'm intervening into this social context in several projects. Today, I'm going to focus on the big project I'm working on, which is a three-year National Institutes of Health funded study. It's through, the, in particular, um, the NIEHS, so the Environmental Health Branch of NIH. And I'm working with a group of, a group of um, epidemiologists and exposure scientists. I'm the lead social scientist. And we are looking at what happens to quality of life and stress levels when you live near this scale of oil and gas production, as well as all of the contested governance and land use issues that surround that, right? Because as we're finding, uncertainty is almost more stressful than knowing what you're being exposed to or knowing the impacts of that. And a lot of this relates to environmental justice in terms of environmental health, right? Who is being exposed to various toxins and chemicals that are released from the process of unconventional oil and gas production? And do we see any patterns in terms of who is most, most exposed to those? And I work with um, Lisa McKenzie and John Adgate. Lisa McKenzie, for those of you who read the post, right, she was just, her study, a recent study was just covered in the post where she found that um, elevated rates of lymphocytic leukemia are correlated with proximity to really densely packed areas of oil and gas production in the state of Colorado. And interestingly, you can tell she, had, she, she hit a nerve there, right, because CDPH and ER, our public health department for the state, came out right away and said, this, this definitely isn't supported, even though they had supplied, she was using their data, right? It's very interesting to watch the political conflicts here. So there's a growing body of evidence, now there's one more study added to it this week, that shows that there are negative public health outcomes related to living in close proximity to oil and gas, and perhaps even living in the same region when we think about air pollution and, and things like that, right? So there's also, though, the problem of long latency periods, right? We can be exposed to various toxins, and some of them will have rather rapid onset, especially for children and elderly populations, right? Children tend to be more sensitive to toxins in their environment and manifest symptoms of exposure earlier because they're developing more quickly, right? This is especially true epigenetically for um, the nine months that we're all in the womb, right? We're essentially in an aquatic environment. In our genetic, the way our genetic code is going to be read, there's a lot of um, really important work being done at Brown University and other places right now looking at what actually happens in the womb in terms of our genetic development and how we are likely, our gene expression is likely to unfold down the road because of what we're being exposed to in the womb. Ways in which things that we think of as being kind of set in stone are actually very vulnerable to what's going on in the environment around us. So all of this 
to get to the point that we can have this ongoing debate about health because so many impacts are unknown, because latency periods can take so long for impacts to manifest themselves, and because of what I mentioned before, this idea of contested illness, that we have this ongoing debate about how vulnerable or open human bodies are to toxins and hazards in the environment around us. So we wanted to cut to the chase, right, and say, regardless of how long it might take a cancer cluster to develop or birth defect clusters accessible to epidemiologists, right, we want to know what happens to people's quality of life and their stress levels because in increased stress has been shown to still lead to health outcomes and riskier or, and risks to our cardiovascular systems especially. So this is what, some of what we were um, examining at first. And what the, this is kind of a, this interesting nexus, right, of risks and uncertainties in our environment. Not just our environment then, right, but also the built environment, the property values that we, that most people pay attention to because that's the, their homes are the biggest investment they're ever going to make. So when things like that enter the picture, right, and this picture I took over in Windsor, right off of County Road 13, um, where there has been, we'll get to this in a moment, but there's been a lot of nimbyism, or not in my backyard, that's occurring in communities like Windsor because of the few recourses that citizens have to actually control where these, where these sorts of facilities are sited. So if you can't see this very well, but we're looking at a rather large, we're looking at one part of a rather large set of well pads and tank batteries and compressors. And over here, these are all homes, right, just down the hill. And as many of you may know, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and other, um, other chemicals and compounds that are emitted during various pro parts of the oil and gas production process, those tend to settle in low areas. And they also tend to settle along water. And for those of you who know, right, the Poudre Trail, the bike path, and all of that is running right along, down this hill, right along here. So all those VOCs, even though this may be up on top of the hill, those, are, those and other contaminants are kind of settling down over these subdivisions. When you drive into the Fort Collins in the area from Denver, on a really bad day, you can, you can see this, right? You can see kind of this blanket of brownish smog kind of hanging over all of us. And like I said, it's due to increased traffic, but it's also due to um, this uptick in oil and gas production. So we're examining those kinds of intersections. Now, we have some preliminary findings. The study is still ongoing, and we have a lot of community. We have several community partners that we're working with, and, um, and we will give them kind of the, the results first. But I feel very special. I'm giving you some preliminary findings here. We're finding that, imagine this, there are quality of life impacts. And I did a three community survey on this, but now I'm, doing, I'm in the middle of doing 60 interviews or more on how people feel their quality of life is being impacted. Because quality of life is a really intangible, personal sort of thing. And we find very different results when we survey people versus when we, um, when we talk to them about what they're experiencing. So people are really feeling the stress of uncertainty, right? They don't know what the health impacts are of what they may or may not be exposed to. They don't know what they're being exposed to. They don't know what this is going to do to their property values. They, the increased seismicity and earthquake activity that we're feeling are due, is due to oil and gas activity, especially re-injecting produced water into the ground, which we are doing more and more in Colorado. They don't know if they're, if they're a child-bearing age, right? They don't know if it's safe to have kids. If they have children, they don't know what the impacts are to those children's health. And the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and other state regulators, like the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, have, according to interviews we're doing, done very little to assuage that uncertainty. Right? So people, especially if they're living near the Triple Creek site in Greeley or the, Bello, the impending Bella Romero site, where you might have 22 or 25 well pads going in right behind your home, this is a constant source of stress and uncertainty and disruption in your daily life. So even if we find out that none of these emissions, those studies have been wrong, and none of these emissions or other toxins being released into the environment have an impact on our health, 
the uncertainty of the situation and the tensions both within neighborhoods, within households and communities that people are experiencing are having real impacts to their health now, right? Their quality of life and their stress levels. There are also increased community tensions, and I mentioned some of this before, but it's my interviews are uncovering that people within households are not getting along very well if they have different views, as well as neighbors feeling like they can't really talk about this with one another. Because if they uncover different viewpoints, things get very divisive very quickly in their neighborhoods. I mentioned this before, but NIMBYism is, is a big problem. For those of you who don't know what that means, in environmental justice, this is kind of a, a, a big phrase, right? It means not in my backyard. That we don't care if these toxins exist or oil and gas development is going on, but I don't want to see it, and I don't want to be exposed to the effluence or the, the environmental bads from it, right? I want it moved down the road. And environmental justice has kind of progressed beyond that since the 90s and, and especially into the, into the 2000s with this idea of not in anyone's backyard, right? We should be talking about changing these production systems fundamentally so that everyone can have access to a safe and healthy environment. What we see happening, though, is um, the lack of control that people have over zoning at the municipal level has kind of devolved decision-making even lower. So that if you live in a subdivision, for example, if you live near Triple Creek, right, and you don't want those 22 well pads put in, your only option to change where that location, where those well pads will be sited, is to find an alternative site and to suggest that to the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and the oil and gas company that is trying to build those well pads. So often in, in Greeley, you'll go to extraction or to synergy, and you'll say, look, we found this other site that you can locate this, these 22 or these 40 well pads on. But what ends up happening is it is located in an area that has less capacity often to fight the siting of those well pads, right? So you end up with, what happens is you end up with a site like Bella Romero, which is an alternative site chosen by another neighborhood, a wealthier neighborhood closer to Windsor. And Bella Romero is a in a part of Greeley that is historically underserved and where many of the people that are um, being invited to public meetings and things aren't even notified in their native language, right? You've got some serious environmental justice issues going on. And you're pitting community members and neighborhoods against one another, which is also contributing in a much deeper way to those community tensions. So the little recourse that groups have is essentially to, to cite the well pad somewhere else. And when activists realize that they're doing this, the angst and the stress that that creates for these individuals, right? Do they not fight this anymore and keep it in their neighborhood? Do they push it on another neighborhood? It's immense, right? I can't tell you the hours I've spent on the phone doing therapy I am not trained to do, right? To talk people through how these feelings of guilt, to me, seem to be normal, right? <laughs> so I, I'm doing a lot of uh, therapy work for the oil and gas industry that I'm not getting paid for. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yes, I should. No, I shouldn't. No, I'm, I've got enough of a target on me now, right? Um, the other thing, the last thing I want to mention is that I, I have done other research funded by the CSU Water Center looking at in a really water scarce region where we are using two to five million gallons of water every time a well is fracked. And of course, and to be fair, that is less than 1% of the fresh water we use in our state. Agriculture in Colorado uses over 85% of our water, right? But what is happening is that water markets are being deeply impacted by the presence of oil and gas without going down a rabbit hole of water rights, which is a very, very deep rabbit hole. I will just say that for those of you who aren't aware, right, we have a really complex system of water rights. We have a water court in the state of Colorado, and we are party to multiple compacts with other states. The 17 western states count on our water from the Colorado River and many other rivers, right? So we are in a state where up until last spring, it wasn't even legal to collect rain off your roof because somebody already owned it, right? So how, I wonder, could the oil and gas industry come in and find out how to access millions upon millions of gallons of water for this relatively new extraction activity, right? 
And what, you, what I ended up finding was that this has actually been economically good for farmers and for ditch companies and others who have the infrastructure or the water um, to be able to rent that to the oil and gas industry. They, they can make a lot of money off of this. And actually, I, I've written a, a few articles about this um, in Journal of Rural Studies and things like that in Pennsylvania, where temporarily, this is a mainstay for farmers, who, small and medium-sized operators, who wouldn't be able to keep their farms otherwise. So it's a really effective form of environmental blackmail in a lot of ways, right? where farmers are leasing their land and leasing their water because that's the only way they stay viable. Now, what happens in addition to that in a place like Colorado with some really involved water markets is that these oil and gas companies can enter into those markets and offer to pay much more to lease an acre foot of water than a farmer would be able to. So, for example, a farmer might be willing to pay $100 in a dry, per acre foot to lease that, that water in a dry year, right? And that's at that top end of what farmers have told me they'd be willing to pay. So, oil and gas industry, according to figures I've heard, and again, it's very difficult to get actual information about this, right? Because it's all a black box. But they are willing to pay $1,500 to $2,000 to rent that same or lease that same acre foot of water. What that means is they can fundamentally distort an already very competitive market and price out people who have junior water rights or folks who don't have any water rights. Right? And in an area like this part of northern Colorado where there's a lot of um, sustainable agricultural activity that is kind of on the uptick and is kind of a new industry, many of those operators don't have um, any water rights, right? So if they're going to get started, they have to be able to afford leasing water to operate. So that is having a fundamental impact on that part of kind of a different part of our economy, right? The, the kind of growing, sustainable agricultural part of our economy. I'm probably running low on time, right? I haven't even been keeping track of time. Oh, crap. OK, there we go. I was going to talk a little bit about this. I already have. I think it's, re it's really important for us to understand how these environmental justice issues are intersectional, right? And they oftentimes come down to how we produce our food, how we produce our energy, and how much water all of that takes, right? And the way in which we decide to use our land. So thank you, guys. Sorry if I took a little too long.